All right, hello everyone. Welcome back. Uh, today in the hottest seminar, we have Ingo Blechschmidt, who is inviting us towards multiversal modal operators for homotopy type theory. Exactly. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and also thank you um, for like being lenient with uh, the communication issues in uh, uh, before this talk started. Um, I invite all of you to follow along. It's um, a little bit of a special talk, perhaps, because we will go to uh, quite a few tangents covering quite a few topics. And uh, that is why I hope that all of you each find something interesting, something worthwhile in it. We will touch um, on type theory, of course, uh, but also on a little bit of set theory, a little bit of topos theory, a little bit of commutative algebra, a little bit of combinatorics, a little bit of philosophy. Um, so let's see. Um, I also invite you to ask questions immediately as they arise. Uh, I have the chat window open. You can also raise your voice. And I think I would like to start with a question on my own, a question posed to you. Namely, I would like to pose a quick formalization riddle. So I will introduce a, not a, a notion um, and uh, you will tell me how to formalize that notion in homotopy type theory. But to this end, have a look at this infinite sequence of natural numbers. The first three terms are already on the board. And right now, this sequence is not yet visibly good. The next, next number turns out to be a one. And still, that sequence is not yet visibly good. However, when the next term appears, which happens to be an eight, then we now see that the sequence is good because some earlier term in the sequence is less than or equal to some later term. And yeah, that remains that way when more terms of that infinite sequence are uncovered. And in fact, uh, that was not like a specially crafted example at all because we have the following theorem. Every infinite sequence whatsoever of natural numbers is good in that some earlier term is less than or equal to some later term. There are lots of proofs of this theorem. Um, it's uh, one of the simplest versions of a theorem called, uh, or lemma called Dixon's lemma. Um, there are classical proofs of the theorem. There are constructive proofs. Just for fun, uh, let me present a classical proof of this theorem, perhaps even an offensive proof because I would like to appeal to the law of gluten middle in the very beginning, appeal to the transfinite, in order to get hold of the absolute minimal value of that infinite sequence. Let's call that alpha i. And then, of course, alpha i will be less than or equal to alpha of i plus one. And hence, we have um, concluded in the, uh, have concluded the proof. Um, there's a special name for um, quasi orders like the natural numbers for which every sequence happens to be good. And in combinatorics, these are called well quasi orders. So a quasi order is well if and only if every sequence from the natural numbers to that quasi order is good to the underlying set of that quasi order. A quasi order is just a set equipped with a relation which is reflexive and transitive. Okay, and that theorem from the top demonstrates that the natural numbers with their usual ordering are a well quasi order. And then there are also a couple of um, uh, closure results. For instance, the Cartesian product of two um, well quasi orders is again a well quasi order equipped with the component wise ordering. Also the uh, quasi order of finite lists um, with a certain um, embedding uh, relation is again a well quasi order and similarly with uh, finite trees instead of finite lists. Um, in case you happen to belong to this internet fan community of people um, uh, embracing very large but still finite natural numbers, um, then the theorem ensuring that tree of X is again a well quasi order 
um, it's called crystals tree theory, is very important for ensuring the finiteness of the number three of three, which has a huge internet following. Okay, so that uh, is a very quick introduction to the theory of well quasi orders. It's um, important in theoretical computer science, or perhaps also in practical computer science, for establishing termination of algorithms. And the question is how to formalize this notion of classical mathematics in homotopy type theory. And let me present one potential answer. This one. So um, the type of witnesses that a quasi order is well, um, yeah, is that type. So um, a value of the type is a function which maps every infinite sequence to a witness that this infinite sequence is good. Um, here I use the propositional truncation. I could have also not used that in order to obtain a small variant of the traditional notion. Um, in case the relation is decidable, then there is no difference because we can always pass to the first good pair find, and find out what is the first good pair. In general, it makes a difference. Um, so there are at least two variants. But I argue that this naive formalization attempt is not good at all. Um, I will argue that uh, on, on the following slides. Are there right now any questions? Good, feel free to interrupt me also later. Let me tell you why I think that this re naive formalization attempt is not good, even though it's so short and sweet and perhaps simple. Um, I think there are three reasons. The first one is that, um, that on philosophical grounds, you could object to this formalization. The reason is, um, in the end, goodness is something which unfolds in the finite, right? If an infinite sequence is good, then already some long enough initial segment is good. So somehow, in some sense, goodness, wellness is something, in some sense, finitary. However, here, um, we are definitely having a very large index, perhaps an uncountable index to that uh, pi type. Yeah. So that's perhaps philosophically not, not as rewarding to have like this amount of transfineness built into the notion. Philosophy aside, um, I argue that this naive formalization is also not practical in the sense that if you want to verify these closure properties that the Cartesian product or lists or trees of elements of well quasi orders are again well, um, then you will need um, axioms of classics, classical mathematics in order to carry out your proof. You will need a little bit of depending, but um, at least the law, something like the law of excluded middle, perhaps even the axiom of dependent choice. Um, even though, though at the end, when you use those closure properties in order to deduce that certain concrete quasi orders are well, um, you notice that they are also that 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 those concrete results also work in constructive mathematics. It's just that the infrastructure lemmas, those closure properties, require classical mathematics if you use the naive formalization. And then lastly, um, I am of the opinion that even though the um, this naive formalization attempt is in some sense quite close to the to the wording of the classical uh, uh, definition, that it's not faithful to it in spirit. And that is because um, we are not quantifying over enough sequences. I'm claiming that the type, the function type of functions from n to x, which supposedly contains all functions from n to x, is actually missing a couple of functions. Okay, and uh, on the next couple of slides, I would like to justify this, this weird claim. And for that, I think it's good to 
just to have a look at one more lemma in the theory of well quasi orders, just for completeness. You don't need to uh, um, uh, follow along regarding the specifics. Um, uh, I'm uh, more relevant for this talk is the, like the general structure. We have the following lemma. Let X be a well quasi order. Let alpha be an infinite sequence. Then the claim is that we find an infinite increasing subsequence. So not only will, we, will the sequence be good with like regarding one pair of terms, but we can find an infinitely increasing subsequence, assuming the law of Slutin middle. Um, how does the classical proof work? Um, well, we consider a certain type I um, that's a type of indices, uh, namely of those uh, of the indices of those terms in the given sequence alpha, which um, which cannot be the earlier component in a good pair. So it's the type of those indices I such that there is no J such that alpha of I is smaller than alpha of J. Then we observe that it cannot be the case that I is in bijection with the natural numbers because else we could extract a subsequence of alpha containing only those terms as um, suggested by the type I to obtain a subsequence which does not contain any good pair, which is not good. And that would be a contradiction to the assumption that X is a well quasi order. Hence, by the law of excluded middle, the type I is finite. And with that information, we are now, uh, now it's easy to construct um, increasing infinite subsequence of the de desired kind. Namely, we just pick some index I zero, which is larger than all the indices in I. And then we know, then we know um, again using LEM, that uh, this term has some later uh, term so that they form a good pair. And then that later term again has some companion term so that they fo uh, form a good pair and so on and so on. And in that fashion, we obtain an infinite increasing sequence. Yeah, Martin, go ahead. Don't you need the pendant choice to keep repeatedly applying LEM? Yes, um, uh, depends on how you formulate it. If you take care to always pick the least index, then you can get rid of dependent choice at the expense of, again, using the law of the middle, but we had to use it anyway, so that's fine. Um, but yeah, if you don't want to pick the first one, then you also need dependent choice. Totally right. Where's that lemma useful? Um, for instance, in proving Dixon's lemma, uh, stating that the product of two well quasi orders is again well. The proof uh, is very short and uh, I think also quite elegant. Um, you do it as follows. Uh, let an infinite sequence gamma um, be given. So gamma is a sequence of pairs. Let's call the first components alpha k and the second components beta k. Then we appeal to the transfinite, so to the lemma from before, to obtain that there is an infinite a monotonic subsequence. And then we consider um, a certain subsequence of beta consisting of exactly those terms as suggested by this subsequence here. And then because y is well, uh, we obtain that this subsequence is good at some point. So we obtain this conclusion for the betas. And trivially, we also have the same for the alphas because that was a monotone subsequence. And hence, um, yeah, we have that increasing property in both components. So the sequence gamma is good. Okay, so that is how you prove Dixon's lemma. I think it's quite a nice proof in some sense. Of course, it's always uh, also an invitation to constructive mathemati mathematicians in order to extract constructive content out of that classical proof, but on its own, it's quite nice. And the point I'm trying to make is that um, in the proof of that proposition, we use the assumption of wellness 
to that monotonic subsequence, but we obtain this monotonic subsequence only using the law of Gödel Miller. And that is one sense, one in two senses, why I'm claiming that the type of supposedly all functions from n to x might be missing some functions, because we cannot trust that sequences which require the law of Gödel Middle in order to be built are actually contained in that type. No? Um, and similarly with the axiom of dependent choice. Um, yeah, so that's one sense. Um, I will, on the next slide, um, show you um, an even stronger version of, um, or stronger examples for sequences which are missing from the type of all functions from n to x. But this is already one, one example in some sense. Um, let me just remark that um, Function types, um, I think I learned that from Martin, um, are a bit weird anyway, right? Because they are severely underspecified by our beloved rules of type theory. So we know how to construct values of a function type by lambda abstraction, and we know how to uh, how to work with values of the function type, namely by applying. Um, but then we don't know exactly what the inhabitants of a function type are. We cannot pattern match on them, for instance. It's not an inductively generated type. In case you agree that uh, the type of functions from n to x is missing those which are which require lem in order to be built, then of course there's a remedy to that, namely just enable lem, switch on lem. Yeah? Then we have that. That remedy, remedy will not be available um, for the kind of missing sequences displayed on the next slide. There are sequences depending on an environment. Let me explain. Let X be a type, more precisely an H set, such that there is no surjection from N to X. In other words, let X be an uncountable set. Then there's definitely and in, uh, yeah, a function from n to x, which is not contained in the type of all maps from n to x, namely the so-called generic enumeration of x. So the generic surjection from the naturals to x. If you've never encountered this idea before, then uh, yeah, this will sound weird. Um, I just introduced x as some set which is uncountable. And then I'm claiming that the function type misses some enumeration of the elements of X. Of course, it misses that because there is none. But um, yeah, I'm claiming that from a different point of view, we still have a subjection from the naturals to X, even if X is assumed to be uncountable. And this subjection, this enumeration is called generic enumeration. Um, and I would like to uh, yeah, introduce you to that generic enumeration. Um, to make sense of that, we call in mathematics, we often use finite approximations in order to approximate infinite ideal objects. For instance, we use um, rational numbers in order to approximate real numbers. And usually we only do that in situations where the ideal objects, for instance, the real numbers actually exist. But in fact, um, we can also use that idea of finite approximations in situations where like the um, convergence point does not exist. Um, we will see how this works uh, just in a moment. And I would also like to remark that in any way, um, uh, like the question of existence is always bordering on the philosophical, right? For, for, for a couple of, of centuries, complex numbers were, were deemed like mysterious, perhaps not existing. Uh, nowadays, we've broadened our notion of existence so that the complex numbers don't pose a problem. Perhaps someday we will also broaden our notion of existence so that um, surjections from n to x exist also in those situations where x is uncountable. Let me be more specific what I mean by that later on. Here's how to make sense of the generic enumeration of x which exists even in situations where X is uncountable. The idea is to approximate fictitious subjections by finite sequences. I picture such a finite sequence 
as a partially defined enumeration, a partially defined function. Yeah, I picture this finite sequence as a as the partially defined function which maps zero to x zero and one to x one and so on. Uh, but yeah, for which which doesn't map n or n plus one or n plus two to to anything. Yeah, it's a partially defined function. And I am prepared to grow such finite approximations to better finite approximations over time. Um, and in fact, I'm prepared to do this growing in two um, uh, different ways. Um, such a finite sequence can grow so that it becomes more defined or so that, so that it becomes more subjective. By more defined, I mean that um, we add some single element y at the end, but we cannot control like which one it will be. We need to um, be prepared that the sequence grows by some additional element at the end. Or we may be, oh, and also we need to be prepared that the sequence grows in such a way that, um, that then some fixed element A is contained in the and the longer sequence. That's the idea. And here's how to formalize that in type theory. There will also be ACTA code next. Um, the thing to notice is that uh, the generic enumeration is not like an actual enumeration. So the statement that alpha of k equals a is not an actual proposition. Instead, it's a stage-dependent proposition. It depends on the current finite approximation to a fictitious subjection. And then somewhere we need to um, yeah, include this bit about those refinements of approximations, one and two. And this we do here in this in that inductively defined data type. And let me explain. Um, given a stage-dependent proposition P, there will be a new stage-dependent proposition called Nabla P. In such a way that Nabla P sigma expresses that no matter how sigma evolves over time to a better approximation tau. Eventually, P tau which you see displayed here. To conclude Nabla P sigma, there are three options. One is to just exhibit a proof of P sigma. And then there are two other options. For instance, the second option here uh, reads as follows. If we want to conclude Nabla P sigma, then um, it suffices to um, give a proof that Nabla P of sigma Y holds for each individual Y. And similarly for the other kind of refinement. And then when we want to express that um, alpha, this generic enumeration is subjective, um, we do it as follows. We say for every element A of X, the empty sequence epsilon will eventually grow to a sequence which contains A among its terms. So that is what we mean when we say that alpha is subjective. Alpha is not an actual function, and hence it can also not actually be subjective, but it's it's a it's an entity which kind of behaves like an actual function, and as in this generalized sense, it's kind of subjective. Okay, and the claim I'm making is that the type of functions from n to x does not contain the generic enumeration. On this slide, I used this um, thing with a subjectivity condition just for um, yeah for for drama. 
Um, just as well, we could talk about not the generic surjection from N to X, but just the generic map from N to X. Uh, we would just get rid of here item number two. And in the actor code, we would just get rid of the final constructor. And that way we would now talk about the generic map from N to X instead of the generic subjection of N to X. And that turns out to be the key idea behind a better formalization of the notion of a well quasi order, which I will show you on the next slide. Any questions right now? Okay. Then let's have a look. That was the naive formalization attempt. And here is an inductive rephrasing, which I think is due to theory. We, we define a quasi order as well, if and only if eventually the empty sequence will evolve to a good sequence where a finite sequence is called good if some earlier term is less than or equal to some later term, like here, and where the notion of eventually is defined using just those two constructors, um, because this has, uh, because we are referring to the generic sequence and not the generic search action. Okay, and with that refined notion of well quasi order, we can now prove all those closure conditions from before in a constructive fashion without requiring the log absolute middle or the axiom of choice or a dependent choice or whatever. Okay, so that is the inductive, uh, inductive rephrasing. You might wonder whether there's a relationship between the naive notion of wellness and the refined notion of wellness. And the answer is, um, that the refined notion of wellness is much, much stronger than the naive version. The converse holds only in presence of a classical principle called bar induction. And if we don't have that, the refined notion will be much more general and much more stronger. And to answer the question, how much stronger exactly, uh, we will go off to our next tangent. This slide concludes a bit about well quasi waters. Okay, the next um, yeah tangent will be just one slide on toposis because I want to. Um, yeah, do a little bit more justice to those generic sequences, generic suggestions. Um, I would like to um, to reify them into actual entities. I don't want the generic sequence to be yeah, some kind of like um, linguistic device um, for writing down su such an inductive definition. Instead, I want the generic sequence to actually be a sequence in the traditional sense of the word. And that is possible using topuses. I'm assuming that um, all of you have seen topuses at some point. I'm not uh, expecting you to be experts in topuses. Here's just like one, um, one slide about topuses. So I picture topuses, by which I mean Grotendieck topuses, as mathematical universes. Um, for instance, there's a Grotendieck topos containing the generic sequence. So in that particular topos, here on that slide called E, the generic sequence actually exists as a honest function from N to X. No inductive definitions, no eventually, no nabla. It's just a particular function from N to X inside that topos. Also the generic subjection exists somewhere in a certain subtop, uh, in a certain topos turns out a certain subtopos of the topos E. And to give perhaps um, yeah, an example of a different kind, but 
uh, if you know um, if you know a bit of purpose theory, then you will realize that they are all very similar examples. Um, perhaps you have encountered densely defined natural numbers before. So that's uh, that's when when you have a natural number, but you don't actually have it. You just not not have it. Yeah. Um, the formal way of saying that is that we have a predicate Q, uh, so a function from n to prop, such that this predicate is satisfied at most once. So if Q of x holds and also Q of y, then x equals y. And also such that it's not, not the case that Qn holds for some n. Yeah, that's a densely defined natural number. It's, it's weaker than an actual natural number where we actually have it. But it's also much stronger than not having natural number at all. Yeah, we here have it up to double negation. Okay, those gadgets don't look like natural numbers, but they are honest natural numbers in a certain topos, in the so-called double negation subtopos of the base. Okay. Um, how can we work internally to our topos? How can we work internally to an alternative mathematical universe um, that might sound uh, yeah, hard or even scary if you're not familiar with that. Like, how, how should we travel to a different mathematical universe? What does that even mean? Yeah? But in the end, it just, uh, it's just a syntactical translation. Um, so the, the theory is made in such a way that when we work internally to our topos, we actually work internal to our base universe, base mathematical universe. It's just that we are working with our objects of the base universe from a, from a different point of view, from a different angle. And I think one of the best examples um, for illustrating this, yeah, this kind of approach is the double negation subtopos. Um, it turns out that um, a statement holds in the double negation subtopos if and only if its translation according to these translation rules holds in the standard topos. So it's just some kind of overloading. Mathematicians overload notation all the time, right? The, the number zero uh, can mean the real number zero, the natural number zero, it can mean the zero vector of some vector space. Um, mathematicians seldomly overload the logical connectives, but uh, in topos theory, we do do that. And if we are using the existential quantifier in the double negation subtopos, then what this actually amounts to is to using not not exists, the double negation of the existential quantifier. And similarly with the other connectives. So that's how we work in the double negation subtopos. And if you want to work in a different um, Grotendieck topos, then it's exactly the same story. It's just a little bit more complex from a technical point of view, um, because instead of double negation, we have a different modal operator, namely that Nabla from, from before. And which version of Nabla exactly depends exactly on the topos. So that is how we can reify those entities, the generic subjection, the generic map, and so on, into, um, into actual entities. It's just that we need to travel to a different place. And you he see here a modal operator, the nabla from before, eventually. And this modal operator is not what um, the title of this talk refers to. We will, um, uh, I, will, I will tell you the modal operators I'm thinking of in a moment. I'd like to go to one more quick tangent, but just very quickly. And if you want to see the details, then I invite you to have a look at the slides, which are already on my webpage, and which will also later be posted to the uh, to the seminar webpage. Namely, an example of commutative algebra. And I will just very quickly go through it because I uh, the details of that are not vital for the rest of this talk. Here's a theorem from 
uh, commutative algebra. It tells you that there's just one situation in which we can have a matrix which has more rows than columns and is still subjective, subjective as a linear map. Namely, the situation that we are working over the trivial ring in which one equals zero. And the uh, as a nice proof goes like this. I don't care about the details right now. I just want to point out that we are using proof by contradiction, and then that we are using a so-called maximal ideal. And together, these two ingredients allow us to pass to undergraduate linear algebra where we work over fields. And there, the statement is well known, and then we are done. So from the point of view of like organizing mathematical knowledge, this proof is very nice because it quickly reduces to a more familiar situation, namely the situation over fields. And then the question is how to make constructive sense out of that proof. And um, uh, so uh, we need to care about this um, proof by contradiction in the beginning, and then this appeal to a maximal idea. And it turns out that proof by contradiction is actually not the, the hard issue here, because there are standard techniques for constructivizing proofs, which are classical only in the sense that they are using LEM. And those standard techniques apply here. Um, so that's not an issue. The more problematic part is that maximal idea. So in classical mathematics, um, we use Zorn's lemma in order to concoct those. And we don't have that available constructively. We don't have that available in pure homotopy type theory. Um, what can we do? Um, well, if the ring happens to be countable, then there is in fact a construction of a maximal idea. So in this set, in this case, we are we are good. And in the general case, well, um, in the general case, we won't have a maximal idea. That's just a fact of life. But we can pass to a suitable topos in which the ring A now appears to be countable because we pass to the topos where we have the generic enumeration, the generic surjection from the naturals to our ring. And then in that topos, we can construct a maximal idea and then continue working there. And um, then the only thing you might like object to is that uh, you, you might say, well, nice. Now in some different topos, we have obtained a maximal idea, but why should I care? I did not care about some auxiliary topos. But the nice thing is that this topos is so nice that regarding bounded first order formulas, there's no difference between the new topos and the base topos. So as long as at the end of the day, we only care about bounded first order formulas, we might just as well work in that problem adapted topos. And um, just for fun, I implemented that approach in ACTA and also un unrolled this like topos theoretic way of making constructive sense of that classical proof. And um, then I obtained this constructive proof, element-based, short, without any appeals to the transfinite. Um, uh, let's suppose that the matrix looks like this. By subjectivity, we have ring elements like that. And then a direct computation uh, shows that one equals zero. I'm presenting this example just to um, just to um, convince you that this idea of generic gadgets living in alternative topuses is actually worthwhile, even if you are, do not care about topuses per se. If you just want to work in your ba fixed base universe and want to obtain results there. Okay, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me. Else we will go to the next tangent before like all the tangents will flow together. Uh, the next tangent will be about set theory. Okay.
A quick timeline of set theory. Um, in 1878, Cantor advances the continuum hypothesis, the claim that there is no infinity strictly between the naturals and the reals. That is an open problem for quite um, uh, quite a bit of time um, until Gödel in 1938 achieves a breakthrough. Gödel proved that if Z of Z is consistent, then also Z of Z plus the assumption that C H holds is consistent. And the way he did that was in, in modern language, um, he um, by, by writing down a model of ZFZ in which CH happens to hold. And then finally, um, CH was settled in 1963 by Cohn um, because Cohn wrote down a model of ZFZ in which the negation of the continuum hypothesis holds. So um, we now know a model of ZFZ in which CH holds, and we also know a model of ZFZ in which CH does not hold, and thereby we can deduce that um, CH is independent of ZFZ. There's neither a ZFZ proof of CH nor of the negation of CH, because there are models of ZFZ for both options. Okay. Still, set theorists wanted to settle CH. Uh, and of course, in view of these results, um, they could not settle it in the traditional sense of the word how mathematicians settle conjectures by giving a proof or a disproof. Instead, they searched and are still searching to this day um, for new axioms, which we might add to Z of C so that then uh, CH is settled by those additional axioms. Um, and this program, um, uh, yeah, it's a very rich, very important program in set theory. And uh, it has um, um, give, uh, it gave rise to lots of interesting results, points of views, techniques. So it's a beautiful program regarding uh, like side results. However, Joel David Hemkins um, claims that this uh, program of adding additional axioms of Z of Z in order to settle CH is doomed, doomed from the start. Because he argues that by now we have uh, set theorists have so much experience with models in which CH holds and also other models in which CH does not hold, so that no proposed additional axiom to Z of Z will achieve community consensus. Yeah, people will always claim that this axiom should not be added to like the official definition of what Z of Z is, because else we would exclude all those very interesting counter models. Instead, Joel David Hemkins offers the multiverse position in the philosophy of set theory, which Briefly speaking, is the idea to just embrace all models of set theory. We don't need to embrace all models equally. We might have some preference, perhaps for models in which CH holds, or perhaps for models in which CH does not hold. But we shouldn't try to enrich that of Z by additional axioms. Instead, we just we should just embrace the multiverse of all models of Z of Z, of all set, set theoretic mathematical worlds. And then in 2016, perhaps also earlier from other people, but I know directly from Alexander, Alexander Oldenseel proposed to study um, the modal multiverse, not of models of set theory, but of topos theory. Um, and yeah, it's that modal multiverse which uh, what uh, which I would like to yeah, port to homotopy type theory, and um, yeah, let me let me tell you about the basics of that um, about a formalized multiverse position. First, starting with set theory, then topos theory, and then type theory. Um, 
Um, so what's a model of set theory? A model of set theory is a structure consisting of some kind of collection, depends a little bit on your meta theory, and a binary relation such that this structure verifies the axioms of, let's say, ZFZ. Uh, you could also um, uh, study models just of ZF or of your favorite intuitionistic set theory. In that way, you obtain um, larger or smaller, a uh, larger or smaller multi set theoretic multiverse. Here are a couple of examples for models of set theory, depending a little bit on like your background on your meta theory. The archetypical example is the class of all sets, sets in case you have that available in your ontology. It will be, might be a model of ZFZ. There's also a sub model of V called L, Google's constructible universe. Then there are all sorts of forcing extensions. So it turns out in set theory that similar to how we can enlarge a ring, for instance, to uh, by passing to a polynomial ring, um, that we can enlarge universes of uh, models of set theory. It's a little bit delicate. We cannot just add a single set and expect the resulting structure to validate the model, the axioms of Z of Z again. We also need to throw in unions um, of old sets with our new set and so on and so on. But there's a tool for uh, for ensuring that everything will work out fine. That's called forcing. And yeah, in that way, we obtain lots and lots of forcing extensions. And then there are also um, those term models resulting just from the mere promise of consistency. And now let's embrace all models of set theory. And let's do that in a formal and modal way. And it's these two modal operators which I would like to port to homotopy type theory. Diamond and box. So diamond phi means that phi holds in some forcing extension of the current universe. And box phi means that phi holds in all extensions of the current universe. Surprisingly, perhaps, you can express diamond phi and box phi entirely within the language of set theory, even though it's referring to like extensions of the base universe, which by their nature go beyond the base universe. Okay, but you can do it. It's a standard procedure in, in set theory. And here are a couple, uh, here are two examples for like insights, which you can formulate using those two modal operators. For instance, you can formulate that the continuum hypothesis is a so-called switch, meaning that no matter where you travel to in the, the, the set theoretic multiverse to some forcing extension of the base universe, you can from there on always travel to a further extension in which CH holds, and you can also travel to another extension in which CH fades. In this sense, the continuum hypothesis is a switch, like, like for switching on a light, yeah, because you can just arbitrarily decide whether the CH should be true or whether it should be false. And you can also re-decide later. Another insight you can formulate using those modal operators is this one here. The existence of an enumeration is a button. Formally, or like more precisely, um, no matter where we are in the multiverse, so no matter in which set theoretic universe, in which model of set theory we are, we can always travel to an extension in which then our favorite set X appears to be countable. And moreover, no matter to which further extension we travel to, the set X will remain countable. That's exactly the set theoretic rendition of that generic surjection from before. Okay. And yeah, Joel David Hempkins and Victoria Gitman and their collaborators are using these two modal operators in order yeah, to 
more precisely explore the range of set theoretic possibility. And it turns out that we can um, transfer this idea to topos theory and then, but, but then also like widen the applicability of that idea. Because when we transfer that to topos theory, we no longer um, are restricted to like studying philosophical questions of set theoretic possibility. Instead, we can also um, yeah, so, so contribute to questions of like ordinary constructive mathematics, not particularly concerned with foundations. Um, here are a couple of examples on the next slide. Um, so that is the definition. We say um, a statement holds everywhere if it holds in every golden D topos over the current base. And then we say that that statement holds somewhere if it holds in some positive topos, and we say that a statement holds proximally um, if it holds in some positive overt topos. Um, for those of you not familiar with the terms positive and overt in that context, let me just say that toposes come in different uh, uh, kinds, and there are toposes which are more similar to the base topos, and um, yeah, a topos which is positive and overt is very much similar to the base topos. In fact, a topos which is positive and overt is um, exactly the same as the base topos regarding bounded first order formulas. Regarding higher structures like function types and so on, uh, such a topos might very well deviate drastically from the base. But regarding uh, bounded first order formulas, there is no difference between the topos and the base. Yeah, so they are uh, um, particularly interesting if at the end of the day, we are interested in the base topos. Okay, using these model operators, we can then formulate the following thoughts. So for instance, for every inhabited set X whatsoever, even including uncountable sets, proximally, in a very good topos, there's an enumeration, a subjection from n to x. So that was this, this encapsulates um, in modal language, that idea of that gadget called generic enumeration. Let's have a look at the second example about well quasi orders. Recall there was the naive formalization, which is not of much use in constructive mathematics. And then there was the refined formulation using this inductive uh, predicate, uh, the inductively defined type, due to, I believe, uh, theory. And uh, yeah, that uh, this refined notion, this inductive notion um, is very good from the point of view of like which proofs we can do with it. However, it's perhaps also a little bit more complex to work with, especially if you are trained in classical combinatorics, uh, where we don't deal in that context with inductive definitions. Instead, we deal with infinite sequences and we deal with um, the argument from the beginning, like, like with that context, uh, like using LEM in order to construct a certain subsequence, which is blah, 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 blah. So the question is, can we uh, have the best of both worlds? Can we work with the inductive definition using an element-based language? And the answer is we can. And um, this second example explains how, because it, it turns out that the quasi-order is well in the inductive sense, if and only if everywhere in every good topos over the base, every sequence is good. Okay. And this also explains why the inductive definition is so much stronger than the naive formulation of wellness. Because the naive formulation just refers to all the sequences in the base topos, yeah? And the inductive definition refers to all in all the toposes, yeah? A much 
So it's a much stronger version of the universal quantification. Um, let's pass to the second to last example here um, about well-founded relations. When you um, grow up uh, mathematically, you first encounter the notion of well-foundedness probably by um, uh, in the following um, uh, guise, namely a relation is well-founded if there's no infinity sending chain. That's the classical definition of well-foundedness. And then later on, um, you learn ACTA or you learn COG or you learn type theory. And there you notice that uh, we have a totally different looking definition of well-foundedness, one using that inductively defined accessibility predicate. And you might wonder whether there is a precise relationship between those. And the answer is yes, there is. Using that model language, you can formulate that. Namely, a relation is well-founded in that inductive sense of that accessibility predicate, if and only if everywhere, there's no infinity sending chain. So again, you can now use element-based language in order to talk about inductive predicates in the background. And here's a very quick example of um, how you can make good use of that. So here's, uh, uh, that's a standard proposition in the theory of well quasi orders. Um, it says that the strict relation associated to a well quasi order is well founded. And the classical proof using the naive definitions of the word well and of the word well founded um, is very simple. Because just observe that if you had an infinite descending chain, then that chain, like every sequence, would also be good, but in but it's strictly descending chain can cannot be good. So very quick one line proof in the classical situation. Now, if you reformulate, if you use the actual inductive definitions of wellness and well-foundedness, you will notice that you can also prove that. Um, you can write down in ACTA, for instance, I did that, it was fun, um, a program of this type. Uh, the left-hand side expressing wellness, the right-hand side expressing well-foundedness in the inductive sense. But you will also, also notice that your proof will, will not resemble the classic proof at all. And that's, again, a point where the, that modal language helps us, because using the modal language, uh, yeah, we can restate the classical proof as follows here. Um, in order to prove well-foundedness, we need to check that everywhere there is no descending chain. OK, but everywhere, if we had an infinite descending chain, then that would be good. And by wellness, by the assumption, we know that everywhere, every sequence is good, not only the base. This idea of exploring the modal topos theoretic multiverse has several precursors. And now on my final slide, I want to tell you about like the current, uh, what we currently know about the modal type theoretic multiverse. Okay, on the positive side, we definitely have that type theoretic multiverse. In fact, we have several variants of that. Um, you could um, be like very liberal and just accept all models of a specific flavor of type, of type theory. Um, and then you have a very large multiverse of models of type theory. You could also be like more picky in which models you allow into your multiverse. For instance, um, you might just allow those models for which currently uh, we have a good understanding how to interpret, interpret universes in them uh, such that they are univalent. Uh, namely, you consider pre-sheaves over um, a category of your choosing times a, a suitable cube category. Um, and also you can take the related chief models for that. Uh, that's a uh, they, they make for a nice multiverse. Um, in fact, a multiverse which varies in several dimensions, right? You can change the category C or you can change the cube category B. 
Okay, so that's what we have on the positive side. On the negative side, um, accessing this multiverse from within type theory is tricky right now. This is uh, in full generality, as of now, an unsolved problem. Um, so in type in set theory, we can um, define those model operators, box and diamond, entirely within set theory. Uh, it's a little bit astounding that this is possible because we are referring to all possible extensions of the base universe. It's it's weird that we can we can do that from the base, but but we can. And similarly, we can do that in topos theory. But in type theory, it's it's a little bit more problematic. Um, um, if let, let me just summarize in a couple of sentences what the issue is. So in order to construct these extensions of the base, we need pre-sheaves and sheaves. So we need to write down what a pre-sheaf is or what a sheaf is. We need to write that down in type theory. Um, if you go on Wikipedia and have a look at the definitions of pre-sheaves and sheaves, you will notice that um, there are certain laws to be satisfied, laws specified using an equal sign. We can write those axioms down in type theory, but then we have those coherence issues. And these are uh, can be over overcome only in certain circumstances. For instance, if we have a little bit of strictness in our base model, um, or in, in certain special cases where we can write down a um, notion of pre-sheaf or sheaf without ever having to refer to laws. Um, that's, for instance, the case when the underlying category of the site, which we want to construct sheaves over, um, is freely generated from a graph. Yeah? There are a couple of special cases like that, but as of now, we are lacking a unified just framework for for doing this for define yeah for talking about sheaves and pre-sheaves, which would then allow us to internally internally define box and diamond. Um, perhaps uh, so. I very much hope that we will make progress on that uh, part. Um, but I want to end on a positive note, namely that even right now, where we don't have like a formal full theory of those modal operators in homotopy type theory, Nabla and, and Vox, we can still feel inspired by them. And more concretely, we can just use Nabla. Nabla, the, the Nabla associated to topuses of our choosing. So we can right now work in ACTA with the generic surjection, with the generic map, with the generic ring, with the generic what, whatever. We just need to put all those Nablas um, at appropriate places in our actor code on our own. There is no, uh, no, no tool support for that. But still, for for uh, lots of application, this is enough. In particular, it was enough for that example with the maximal ideals, where I got exactly that. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, this is a positive note. We don't need the full formal theory in order to extract already now practical consequences. And with that, I'd like to conclude the talk. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm eager to learn about your questions. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Let's visually applaud. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you. So anyone, uh, yeah, feel free to just unmute yourself and, and ask. Can I ask a question? Yep. So can you go? I have lots of questions about slide nine, actually. Good, slide nine, yes. Mm -hmm. So one question is that uh, there seems to be some asymmetry in the points one, two, three. Yeah. For example, there is only one box, but two diamonds. And another asymmetry is that um, you can see they're posi positive and overt. And positive, but uh, you don't consider overt alone. Yeah. And yeah. Um, when you discussed uh, the conjunction of positive and overt, then you say, yeah. well, this preserves uh, all um, first order logic uh, statements. Yeah. Preserves and reflects. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, what is exactly is the statement for two regarding uh, this? For, for two, it that uh, it preserves and also reflects um, geometric implications, geometric sequence. Right. Yeah. So uh, a topos is positive if and only if the geometric morphism to the base is a subjective geometric morphism, mm -hmm. and a topos is overt if and only if that canonical geometric morphism is an open geometric morphism. And to answer your question about that asymmetry, um, indeed, very good point. And this is also something which uh, blocked Alexander and myself um, for a long time from working on that. Because, um, you know, we, we went on the NLAP, um, geometric morphism, and uh, we realized that there are just lots and lots of um, adjectives you can put on geometric morphisms, yeah? So they are the subjective, they are the open, but they are also closed, whatever, whatever. There's a whole host of, um, of niceness properties of geometric morphisms. Um, and all of them have some claim of expressing the idea of an extension of the topos, similar to forcing extensions in set theory. But uh, for a long time, we yeah, didn't really know uh, we were just scared by the multitude of options. In set theory, it's much easier. There's just one um, well-known notion of ex one or two well-known notions um, of extensions of, of models of set theory, namely forcing extensions. There are all kinds of forcing extensions, but it's always just forcing extensions. And in topos theory, we have much more flexibility. And um, yeah, a turning point in, in this development came when we just decided slash observed that it just so happens that these particular kinds of toposes are already very interesting to give uh, rise to a, like rich modal situations. So I very much like, for instance, these couple of examples here about the uh, well-founded relations and the well quasi orders and so on and so forth. And it just turns out that these work very well with exactly those three modal operators. But we should definitely also consider lots of variants. For instance, the variant you just suggested, suggested where we just had to, uh, include over overt but not positive and see which kind of statements we can make then. But already these are nice. And if I may ask another question in a completely different direction. Yeah. So where can we find your ACTA code and how much of this have you formalized in the ACTA code? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the ACTA code is uh, on GitHub. Um, mm -hmm. I will put a link um, uh, in the slides. Um, and how much did I formalize? Well, I did not formalize um, the general theory because as of now, I don't know how to formalize the general theory in um, in the kind of type theory supported by ACTA. Uh, if if we uh, um, if we allow UIP, then all problems vanish. But I don't want to allow UIP. Um, uh, so what is the extent of what I did? Um, I did exactly what I needed in order to do this example with the maximal ideals. Uh, so I implemented what I needed in order to write down this classical proof in ACTA, which then it, in actual practice turned out to be this one, like after unwinding. Yeah, um, As you know, and as you know much better than, than I do, you can run ACTA programs. And if I run this ACTA proof, then I will, um, then ACTA will compute this witness. And um, so to be more precise, I implemented this uh, NABLA um, and then what I needed from commutative algebra about um, the construction of the maximal ideal in the countable case, and that's it. Uh, it, it was uh, very much fun. It's also not long at all. It's like 100 lines of code. Um, in the end, it's very concrete, even though lots of like deep philosophical ideas play a role here, but in the end, it's Regarding actor code, it's it's very simple and, and just pleasant. Thank you. Thank you for the answers and thank you for the talk. Glad you like it. Any further questions, comments, wishes?
Um, uh, uh, Ulrich has just asked a question in the, in the chat. Right. Um, he's asking, can you have a pi type that ranges over all sequences everywhere? Um, yes. Uh, yes, I believe. So, so right now, the answer is I don't know how that should be done. But um, uh, but in morally, the answer should be yes. Um, namely, that pi type will start as follows. It will first be a pi type over all possible sites, Grotendieck sites, yeah? um, over all small Grotendieck sites or Grotendieck sites of some living in some universe of type theory. Um, and then uh, we can further quantify over all the functions in that in the Grotendieck topos built from that Grotendieck site. So the, it's a kind of huge quantification, but it's certainly doable in, in type theory. Um, except that we don't know how, how to define what a sheep or what a pre-sheep is. And the second question of Ulrich is, um, are there issues of predictivity? For instance, should everywhere P be stratified? And if not, why not? Um, good question. Um, I think I think actually there are no issues of predictivity. Um, um, I, I, I base this claim of mine on the fact that uh, this thing with, the, with these model operators can also be formulated in the context of arithmetic universes. So the predicative cousins of toposes. Um, uh, we, we, need, we need to restrict a little bit. Uh, we, we then need to restrict to sites in which all coverings are finite. Um, at least I currently think that we need this restriction. I don't know how to define sheification in a predicative context when we have infinitely um, long coverings. Um, but other than that, it, uh, it, it should work and hence I think there are no issues of predictability in that particular regard. That was a great talk, and I have a question, a couple of questions. So yeah. on this slide, you've you've got your your nabla, or sorry, your box and your diamond and your double diamond. Yeah. And you mentioned that you're not sure uh, a way to sort of internalize them. Is there a way to axiomatize them, like to simply postulate that they exist with certain properties? Uh huh. Um, yeah, great idea. I haven't thought about that, but I think it's a great idea. Um, and I think it that might actually, yeah, be a very nice step forward because, um, so in type theory, you have several kinds of type formers, right? And um, let me say that just one of them is, is truly complicated in this business, namely uh, the type former giving us the type theoretic universe. So um, uh, for, for type theories uh, where we don't have a universe, just pi types, sigma types, uh, equality types, and so on, um, uh, we already know how to like like make sense of this translation. It's just when we also allow universes, but um, our the current state of the knowledge not of our knowledge is not enough. Um, so if we axiomatize, and perhaps if we axiomatize just a fragment not containing universes, then this might already be kind of nice for several applications. Of course, in the end, we also definitely want to talk about universes. Um, but uh, it might be a nice intermediate step. Yeah. And there are ways to talk about universe sort of, uh, talk about univalence sort of locally without referring directly to the universe that maybe could also could allow some univalence to be present without assuming a full universe. Yeah, uh, also, uh, also a good idea, right. Um, we should explore that, yeah, okay. yeah. And then so sort of related. So, so you said that without the universes, there's some way to do this. And I guess this must relate to how it's possible in set theory to do this, which I, like you said, I find really surprising. Yeah. Like, is it possible to say something about how, how that works? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, 
It's actually related to Ulrich's first question. Um, so you just need to remember that um, that every Grotendieck topos is presented by a site, by a small site. Yeah. So if you would be tempted to say in every topos something holds, um, and you notice that you cannot do this kind of huge quantification in your meta theory, then just say for every small site, and then continue by saying, well, in the topos generated by that site, it holds that. Um, and this is then something which you can just inductively define depending on the structure of the formula in question. Um, for instance, if I would um, claim that in every topos, the binomial theorem for natural numbers holds, yeah, and then I would formalize that by saying for every small site, um, um, the equalizer between um, the constant sheaf n over that site um, between a pair of parallel morphisms starting uh, uh, with codomain, the constant sheaf n, one expressing the left-hand side of the binomial theorem and the other the right-hand side of the binomial theorem, but this equalizer is already all of the of the constant sheaf. So this is how, how I would do it. And similarly for other um, uh, yeah, more, con more involved formulas. Um, so to summarize, use sites as proxies for toposes and exploit that even though the class of all sheaves, for instance, is a proper class, um, individual sheaves are just small objects. So that's, that is how it works. And uh, similarly, it works in, in set theory. Um, there we quantify over all possible forcing posets because a forcing extension in set theory is generated by a small forcing poset. So the, the first explanation, I guess, is, is something like Unraveling the you know the the internal language yeah. of the yeah. generated token. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's very nice. Okay. I, I may have one or two more, but I'll let other people jump in at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh well, I'll jump in just by asking, so why homotopy type theory? Um, so is it just that you think that's a, that's a good base to work over, or the or does it uh is univalence useful here in particular? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, um, so firstly, um, you don't, you are not forced to try to implement these ideas in homotopy type theory. If you right. want to develop them in a other kind of type theory, then, then go ahead, yeah? Um, and in particular, people did go ahead and define sheaves and pre-sheaves in several versions of type theory. And where in the cases where they succeeded, it will it will certainly be possible to give a formal account of um, of those new modal operators um, uh, diamond and box. Why am I particularly interested in homotopy type theory? Um, well, um, because just for general reasons, I'm interested in homotopy type theory, and hence I also want to transfer that modal universe universe, which I've grown to appreciate from the set theoretic and topos theoretic world to type theory. To be a little bit more um, specific, um, you might know that there's a thing called synthetic algebraic geometry, where we try to um, build a framework for doing algebraic geometry um, using a nice, naive language, but in such a way that it's um, uh, that in the end, it compiles down to very modern algebraic geometry. Algebraic geometry over arbitrary schemes as space instead of uh, just the complex numbers as space. We want to have um, simple language like in the complex number situation for general situations. Um, uh, I think there was a talk in, in, in the hottest seminar a, a couple of weeks ago by Felix Cherubini. On, on this program. And um, yeah, there are then several choices for the foundational framework in which to develop synthetic algebraic geometry. Uh, in my PhD thesis, um, I started 
by just using as my framework the framework of one purposes. Um, but then the Göteborg School extended that to the framework of, uh, framework of the homotopy type theory. And for many uh, situations in synthetic algebraic geometry, you actually don't need it. You don't need universes, you don't need univalents. Okay. Um, which is why I was able to carry out this program a little bit in my PhD thesis. Yeah, at that point, um, I just kind of knew about homotopy theory, but I would definitely not be able to um, base my PhD th thesis in it. But then it turns out that there are a couple of situations in synthetic algebraic geometry where univalence is a crucial tool, an extremely crucial tool. And that includes um, a cohomology. Um, so you, you know how to define cohomology in homotopy type theory, right? And uh, you perhaps also know how to define cohomology in algebraic uh, geometry, in traditional algebraic geometry. And you notice that those two definitions don't look at all the same. Uh, the cohomology definition in, in traditional algebraic geometry is very much ad hoc. Uh, it's not at all as pleasant as in homotopy type theory that we just take the truncation of the home space. And um, yeah, thanks to univalence in synthetic algebraic geometry, um, we can use the nice elegant hom homotopy definition and prove that it gives the same results as as what traditional synthetic algebraic as traditional algebraic geometers expect. And um, yeah, that's my personal reason why um, why among other reasons um, I like homotopy type theory, and hence I would like to have a model homotopy type theoretic matrix. Great, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, if no one else is, is jumping in, I'll, I'll ask another question or two. Um, so in practice, currently, you can't use box or diamond, but you said you can use nabla. Yeah. And just to be clear, there's actually several nablas, right? There's a yeah, nabla. lots of nablas. Taylor One number yeah. for for each Grotendieck topos, mm -hmm. and um, uh, yeah, for uh, yeah, right, several numbers. Or and for instance, um, you can express, uh, you can work with a generic uh, surjection like like this. Uh, sorry, it's um, a little bit like this. Um, so you can express in actor. You can write down and prove that alpha is surjective. It's just that. You cannot write for every A, A happens to be an element of sigma because that might just be false. Sigma is not as, as of yet, not yet uh, developed far enough. You need to put that nabla uh, there on your own. You need to put the nabla in front of every existential or quantifier or sigma and also in front of every disjunction. Yeah, that's that sounds really interesting. I, I'm going to look at your AGTA code and see how mm -hmm. you did that yeah. in practice. Um, okay, completely different question. Um, you mentioned bar induction at one point. Yeah, uh, right. I, did, I didn't know what that was. Can you can you say? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sure. Let me uh, go to it. Um, it's yeah. Um, yeah. Well, bar induction. One way to uh, um, uh, to uh, extend what bar induction is, um, it's more ex more or less exactly that converse here, only in a slightly more general situation. Um, so here, realness um, uh, refers as states in some sense, either in the direct naive sense or in the deductive sense, that every sequence is good. Right? You could also uh, care about other properties than goodness. For instance, that a sequence contains repeating terms or whatever, depends on the situation that your prime numbers uh, occur somewhere. And bar induction is exactly the logical principle which, tell, which tells you that if you know for every actual sequence that some property P holds, that then also we have an inductive witness of this situation. That's bar induction. And um, yeah, if you uh, go on Wikipedia, you will notice that there are several versions of bar induction where you then restrict to 
certain kinds of predicates. For instance, there's something called decidable bar induction, where you only want this converse to hold for decidable predicates and, and then for monotone and so on and so forth. But that's the general idea. Uh, bar induction is implied by the conjunction of the log exclude middle and uh, dependent choice. Yeah, the idea is um, if you want to prove the converse, so if you want to show that um, that there's an inductive witness of wellness or whatever, um, then you say, well, assume not. And then thereby you construct a tree, a counter example tree. And uh, then you pick one path through that tree and that will then be a counter example sequence. And you know that there cannot be counter example sequences because of the assumption. And then you are done. That's a general idea. Um, yeah, so it's a principle which holds in classical mathematics. Um, it does not hold in general in constructive mathematics, but it's also not entirely unconstructive. Yeah, for instance, it does hold in the effect of topos, assuming that it holds on the meta level. Yeah, so it's kind of in between. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, Okay, well, maybe that's a good note to end the, the questions on. So let's uh, thank Ingo again. It was a very uh, interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great many questions. Thank you. And then, yeah, uh, let's uh, have a nice evening and um, enjoy the next installment of the series. Thanks again to the organizers for making this happen. I will spin yes. around in the chat in case there are additional questions, but um, yeah. See you. Great, thank you.